Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to the Transatlantic Call-In Show. This is the place where you get to call in and talk to two trans people. Oh, we're getting some camera lag. Sorry. Ooh, uh, I got to talk to two trans people about. All right, all right. I got to turn the blur off because it's gonna be it's gonna be a jerk the whole time. You can see how messy my room truly is. Uh, you get to call in and talk to two trans people about all your questions of anything and everything related to trans rights. Although we do reserve the personal discretion to uh, uh, be bothered by your personal topic and not take it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I am your host, uh, Arden Hart, today. And with me is the uh, wonderful, brilliant accomplished dr ben i don't know if those are words uh i'm tired dr ben today tired dr ben yep. uh yeah i'm also tired ben and i are both in a mood today and not really up for bullshit so uh yep. you might get uh more spice you might get absolutely zero spice we'll see how it goes while uh while the show's rolling also, man, my camera lag is so intense right now. I wonder if that's coming through the video. Sorry to, like, live produce as we're doing this, but uh, I'd really rather it not be like that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what's right. going on. We're just going to roll with it. We're just going to roll with it because I don't have time to fix it. So, uh, yeah, if you want to call in, the number is 720-619-2288, and uh, there's also a web link in the description, so if you are an international viewer and you want to call in and not have exorbitant tolls, that is a way for you to do that. Uh, uh, yeah, Jen says it's not that bad. Oh, uh, okay, I'll take your word for it, uh, as long as it's not too intrusive to the show. Um, so we're not going to waste too much time with bullshit today. We're just going to jump right into the polls so we can get calls rolling. Uh, last okay. week's poll was uh, federal courts have ruled drag is free speech and bans on it unconstitutional. Do you think this is the right call? And 96% said yes. 4% said no. That's about what I would expect. Um, I think even though we tend to get some uh, just asking questions types or some of the annoying taking libertarianism too far types i think pretty much everyone is on board with drag being free speech except for like extremely right-wing maga republicans who want to frame all lgbt people as groomers so this doesn't seem surprising to me and i'm pretty happy with those results what do you think ben yeah i mean i'm not really surprised either um we kind of talked about this poll last week it's at least in our space, this isn't super controversial. Mm -hmm. Like, it's hilarious that this is even a debate at all because why do people care this much? I don't know. It's, it's a thing. I think yep. this is a pretty reasonable split. Yeah, yeah, that's about what I would expect. Uh, and actually, this kind of segues really nicely into this week's poll, which is... Do you think becoming more tra transphobic will help right-wing political parties win elections? Uh, yes or no. So this is kind of related to this stuff. Uh, it's also related to the... Uh, there's a lot of data on how politicians in the U.S. who did most of their branding and political messaging around anti-trans advocacy, uh, how they performed in elections, which was pretty poorly across the board, as well as uh, the stuff we've been seeing in the UK over the past week with the uh, uh, attempt to ban trans women from female hospital wards. Uh, there was some other stuff that was going on in the UK as well, but I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a Brit, so I don't know it all, maybe as well as Katie would, but I think Katie might be on uh, next week. I'm not entirely sure right at the second. So hopefully she'll be able to let you guys know what's up uh, with the reality of the situation. Um, ben, do you have any, have you seen that stuff? I know you've been busy being a doctor and all. So uh, yeah, uh, I think, I, I mean, I live in the U S I think I've seen more of what's been going on with, I guess the disconnect of the internet versus real life. And of course mm -hmm. the anti-trans, rhetoric is very pervasive on the in the internet space and 
I think a lot of people take that uh, the feedback they get from the internet and think that that's real life and that's accurate of the the bigger picture of society, and it's really not. Um, yeah, like the people on the internet who care about trans issues are very very vocal about it, but the majority of the public really doesn't care that much. Like it's surprising. I know we're we're here constantly talking about this because we're in that internet space. But for them, for most people, it's not that common of a conversation topic. And yeah. I think already the public has different priorities for how they vote. Um, and I think it's not as much of an issue to the majority of voters, at least in the U.S. Again, I can't speak for the U.K., um, but like it just it, it seems to be much more magnified of an issue online. Um, and I think it, it is coming back to bite some people um, who just aren't really accurately weighing the the data and where it's coming from. So I think that's my stance. Yeah, no, I think that's very, very true. I think most people aren't as concerned with trans rights as you would assume if you were on the political sphere. It's difficult because there is so much political advocacy, even between like, it seems like uh, actual politicians that happens in the online space. I mean, you know, uh, with the ousting of uh, Kevin McCarthy, Matt Gates and him were posting like, bring it and I just did back and forth on Twitter. Uh, but at the same time, it really doesn't seem like, uh... oop, uh, sorry, I just got a message in chat. Um... Oh yeah, no, that's okay, Jen. Uh, I tend to leave that on for a little bit. Um... Yeah, it's, it seems like there's a lot of stuff that does go on on Twitter, but at the same time, uh, when you interact with people in real life, there are usually their opinions on trans are, trans issues are proportioned almost exactly to how much they know, which is, I don't know about trans people, they're probably fine, it's probably similar to gay people, and I don't, you know, it, it's, my experience with people is that they tend to not have strong feelings, and they tend to just kind of mind their own business, and uh, that's a, position I'm fine with most people having. I think most people ought to not be heavily involved with trans rights aside from saying, hey, if they're not hurting anyone, maybe we shouldn't be legislating against them. But uh, yeah, I would love it if some UK viewers who maybe had some uh, thoughts to offer in the chat or in super chats or uh, maybe a call could uh, give some perspective because obviously this is more influenced by the things I've been saying come out of the UK uh, over the past few days because there hasn't been a lot of trans-specific news in the US over the past few days. But I do think it applies more broadly. Uh, as the right wing is getting more and more radicalized, it is losing them favorability in a lot of the uh, countries where they're trying to do that. So, Okay, uh, so we wasted like no time there. Sub 10 minutes uh, getting in and out of the polls. Usually we go to like the 15 yeah. minute mark. But like we said, we are in a no bullshit mood today. So uh, we're just gonna dive right into some callers. Um, let's, uh, all right. <laughs> we're just gonna take caller number one. Uh, Sophie in Germany, pronouns are she, her. Sophie, you are live on Transatlantic. What's going on? Uh, hello, uh, I, it's it's me, formerly known as Simon from Germany. I thought this time I'd change my name and pronouns. Awesome. Um, and I had a question because this is something that I legitimately didn't or w w wasn't aware of, that it's possible to be happy and trans. I sure. thought that by being trans, you ought to hate yourself just by the diagnosis. And I brought that up somewhere and then a bunch of people told me that doesn't have to be the case. And I wanted to ca wanted to ask like, if that's true and like how realistic is it for a trans person to become happy? Mm. Yeah, um, so I kind of wanted jump on this and say that i mean there's a couple different factors here number one 
like you're content with actual like with your identity um, as a trans person versus happiness with the situations in society. And I think there's a, mm -hmm. a distinct separation there. Um, and I think like it's reasonable to be frustrated and upset about things going on in the environment and in society. But if if it's to a place where you are genuinely sad about being yourself, uh, I would be concerned about depression and you probably need more of a professional to talk to because uh, that's not something that's normal and it should not be normal. I know there's a lot of trans people that have okay. feelings like that and we kind of, like it, it's one thing to to normalize the experience of, of having depression and that's totally valid. Like I support having these conversations and making it more normalized as a, as a topic, but at the same time, like you shouldn't be saying that I feel depressed, I should just not do anything about it, this is normal you should talk to somebody about it because you shouldn't yeah, have I, to I, feel like you, you shouldn't feel ashamed to be yourself. You shouldn't feel like you hate yourself every day. Like that's something that needs to be looked into more professionally. Yeah, I definitely, I, I have, I, I do have a therapist and for, for gender dysphoria and for depression. And he did diagnose me as like severely depressed because of the inner dysphoria. And he also said that I have like a strong self-hatred that comes with it and like hating being trans. Um, I just, yeah, I just, um, I, I, I know this isn't a therapy session. I don't want to go too deeply into it. I just, I just didn't even know that like, being trans is something that isn't necessarily yeah. related to hating yourself. <laughs> I, I will I'll tell you, I, I I try not to talk I try to talk about my life and my the personal facts about my life as more of a, a narrative fact, like this thing happened to me and not talk about my feelings too much on these shows. But I'll tell you, I have clinical depression uh, and I've been in a depressive rut for like two weeks. And it's been pretty rough for me. Uh, but that is distinct from, like, my transness. I have mental illness, and it weighs on me a lot. And I feel a lot of those feelings you're feeling. And sometimes they do feel like they converge with transness, but I don't think that's because of being trans. It's more that I am depressed and already predisposed to viewing pretty much everything in my life extremely negatively uh, mm. and having been raised in a society where trans people were framed in such an awful way uh, and kind of conditioned in those beliefs yourself, uh, it's pretty easy to, for your brain to, what when you're having those depressive feelings, to sort of latch on to something that has been present in your life for a long time, which is something like, oh, trans people are weird or or gay people uh, make me feel gross or something like that. Like those are things that people get raised, those messages that people get raised up, uh, those messages are being projected at them, you know, and it's easy for your brain, even if you know logically those things aren't true, to still sort of dip into those feelings sometimes. Uh, and it's a process, uh, yeah, I... Un unlearning conditioning and unlearning the uh, the sort of, things that you were uh, taught to think about queer people it takes time. And even if you are a queer person, it doesn't magically just wave a wand. And because you learned that you're trans and you want to transition, suddenly you're it, like, you aren't going to suddenly unlearn all those things. Right. Like that's why we have words like internalized yeah. transphobia and internalized homophobia. Cause those things can be so deeply pushed into you that they can reflect inward at yourself. Yeah. I, I used to think growing up that, trans people are like degenerates, mentally ill people that just like lost the inner battle against their desires. And that's why I was like, I always thought like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna be the good trans person that's not gonna like lose to their bad thoughts. <laughs> and so I'm like always like, um, <laughs> um, 
held back and never like admitted it to anyone or accepted it and I always tried to fight it back until I couldn't anymore and now I'm stuck with a lot of these I am still stuck with a lot of these old thoughts and like bigoted thought patterns I guess towards myself yeah. Yeah. is there a um, something, way to get rid something of with that something with that I just I just want to say like uh, a phrase that you just used uh, is a little bit concerning and I want you to try to work on not thinking of yourself in this way like like saying that you uh, want to be one of the one of the good trans people like you're not a representative of every trans person like you're you're mm -hmm. you you're a representative of you so don't hold this burden of like I have to be this for the trans community I have to be the person that's not mentally ill so that other people understand that trans people aren't so bad like that is literally not your responsibility and that might be making your depression worse so like that, focus that's on a good thing that you said person. that because like, that's literally a, something that i thought about a lot yeah work on this with your therapist but like i i think like a few things need to happen here and like i I'm in a mood today, so I'm going to be a lot more blunt than usual. But like, focus on being a good person, not necessarily being a good trans person, or like having to tell everybody that you're trans. All like, just be a good person. Like, be you. Be uh, mm -hmm. like, do the things that you feel happy doing. Um, and if you find that there are things that used to make you happy that don't make you happy anymore, that might be a sign of depression, and that's something that you can work with your therapist about. Um, but like something else is like, and I've, I haven't been on the internet a whole lot recently and it's been amazing for my mental health. Like I, a lot of my self hatred and things I'm not experiencing right now because I'm doing other things and the people I'm around really don't care that I'm trans. Like I'm just a person to these people. Like yeah. the people I work with don't care that I'm trans. They care that I'm a good doctor like that. That's it. My transness isn't really a question unless it's relevant at the time. So like mm. maybe it, it'd be smart and I'm not saying to like leave the internet as a whole and like, cause I know there's a community here that you might not get other places, but like a, taking a step back might be helpful and might be the best thing for you. And especially if you're having questions about like self-hatred, maybe, maybe you're not in the best environment to really discover yourself. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, my, it, my, my best friend also told me something similar. That's why I basically left all political places because I was always like trying to be like the one that's arguing against all the right wingers to prove that the trans people aren't all evil. And that definitely didn't help. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I really, Sophie, I also have the urge to always you know, th that's why the show exists. I mean, because Katie and I, like, two and a half, almost three years ago now, were like, man, there's really no no place for us to sort of do that on a better forum than Twitter. And so we wanted to make that place. But I will tell you, uh, it what Ben said is absolutely true. It is not going to help your mental health. And it will often lead you to have a perspective of things that is a lot darker than the reality is and I do think trying to get out and spend time more time with your friends and I like what Ben was saying like doing things that make you happy and being a good person like being involved with your community those things are going to go so much farther to making you feel good and making you feel more secure as a trans person you know not as necessarily a woman or as like whatever gender but just like knowing whatever people see me as I I am me and I'm secure with that uh, and everything else mm. kind of falls into place after the fact, in my opinion. But uh, also, uh, like Ben also pointed out, the, the a lot of these thoughts sound like clinical depression. We are, well, I, I'm definitely not uh, a mental health specialist, and I don't think Ben is trying to give no. uh, yeah, medical totally. advice. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna sue poor Ben here. Okay, he, Ben deserves his doctor title. I'm not gonna take any. I'm not gonna take this as medical advice. Well, I will always like I will always give advice to go see uh, a professional. 
Um, that is mm. that is the one piece of advice I can confidently give every single person is mm. like, go see a professional in that area of expertise. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for taking my call. I, uh, as always, just, yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Sophie. Wait. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely less uh, a, a, a gentle with our feelings today. All right. <laughs> Let's uh, keep powering through. We're going to take uh, caller number two, Kara in California. Pronouns are she, her. Kara, you are on the line. What is going on? Hey, what's up, Arden and Ben? How's it going? Doing good. What's, uh, uh, what's your topic today? I wanted to bring up a, uh, something I keep noticing when it comes to the debate on trans access to bathrooms and locker rooms is that we always get drawn in to like a rope-a-dope situation of making it about trans people as a boogeyman rather than just busting through that narrative and basically saying as a humanist, I'm personally a humanist as well as a trans woman, that I don't care what the gender or sex of the person is. And just saying, hey, if you know somebody who identifies as a man or is a male wants to go into the women's restroom because there's no stalls or urinals available in the men, go right ahead. I don't even think that these things should exist. These boundaries should exist. So I think uh, personally, when somebody brings up this narrative online, which is usually where it happens, most people in you know, real spaces don't actually have as much nerve to bring these things forward necessarily. But I always just break through that argument and say, well, I don't really care if they're trans. This is my position. And I think in the long run, that would kind of benefit us more than getting narrowed down to just trans women let's face it, it's mostly just about trans women, um, than to fall into this trap of making it just about us. Um, I'll leave you with that and just let you discuss it. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you, Kara. I appreciate right. that. And we'll uh, talk to you later. Uh, okay. So I have a couple feelings about that because while I agree that uh, these sort of laws affect more than just trans people. I mean, I believe the few people who have been affected by like the Florida laws were, or the first people who, before the laws got passed when they were being floated, were all cis women. Um, so no question do these things all affect cis women. And actually, this is a converse, kind of similar to a conversation Matt and I were having recently um, about how a lot of the times the things that we're advocating for, we make about you know, gay people or trans people, when in reality, they're issues that affect all people. But I will say there's a reason that we talk about gay people and trans people experiencing discrimination in these ways. And I think it's because, well, maybe at like a base rate statistics level, uh, cis people are probably getting uh, um, discriminated against at a higher level. Uh, when we're talking about like proportionality, trans people are disproportionately targeted by these things, right? Like they are designed to attack us specifically. So I think it's perfectly reasonable for us to spend a lot of time talking about how these things are disproportionately aimed to impact trans people. But I'm perfectly comfortable and have done in many situations on this topic, on this show, mentioned that these laws affect cis people probably you know, in raw numbers more than they affect trans people uh, just because there are a lot more cis people than trans people. Um, but yeah, Ben, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there's something to be said here uh, where I agree. Like I agree with Arden and I agree largely with the caller. Um, the, the question is how do we, engage in this conversation and where do we go from here and i think that's the sticky part and when we talk about any gender related issues yeah it's very easy to be super progressive and able to process kind of these more abstract topics within the trans community but you have to remember that society as a whole 
like has been kind of dealing with this baggage of gender roles and like gender segregation for pretty much ever since humanity has existed. Um, and the conversation needs to be at a bit more of a basic level for them. I'm not saying that cis, cis have people are like less intelligent. What I'm saying is like they, they have these conversations less and they're maybe less prepared to discuss some more of the nuance and the abstract nature of gender identity and, and gender roles. Like they have kind of floated along um, in the societal structure for a while. And, and sure, plenty of people are pointing out where, where this is problematic, but a lot of people just aren't, aren't at a place where they can really discuss that at depth yet. And so we kind of have to ease them into it. Like, and if you're having a discussion about the bathroom issue with cis people um like it's okay eventually maybe to to get to some more of those nuanced points but starting there might just be more confusing and lead to more miscommunication at the beginning so kind of easing them into like what people understand about gender and about gender roles and gender segregation like why are these things uh even in place in society like i i think too often we're used to talking to each other and forget that we need to put on like a different lens when talking with some people that don't share our experiences. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I agree with the um, discussion with all the points so far. Uh, just, I think we need some, we just need, to be maybe a bit more gentle and clear when talking to people that don't share our perspectives on it. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, could be kind of like an approach of starting with talking about the more humanist approach and how it affects mm -hmm. everyone and then kind of moving into the disproportionate effect that that might have on certain groups uh, after the fact. Uh, yeah, I, th that's, that, that's a pretty good point. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything else to add to that. All right, we're just yeah. gonna keep cruising on. We're only at two thirty, and uh, we've already gotten through. Was it three calls, or is that two calls? I can't count. Yeah, get your calls. Uh, Bring your spicy calls, because I, I want to yell at somebody. Well, good thing <laughs> because we're gonna take caller number three, Jay in Washington. Oh, pronouns awesome. are he, him. Uh, Jay, you are <laughs> on the line. What's going on? Hi. <laughs> good to uh, talk to you guys. <clears throat> Um, so my, my friend, I've, I've known them as a, a trans man that the, the entire time I've known them, but I'm kind of attracted to them as, uh, a female and it's how, how do you deal with being attracted to somebody yeah, can who's I, trans? I'm going to stop you right here and I'm going to sound like an absolute asshole, but as a trans man, like if you're attracted to them as a female, you are not attracted to them. Like that's not who they are. So I really don't care what your thoughts on them are. Like their existence is not there to be attractive to you. So you can literally find somebody else. Um, and if you have feelings, that's fine. Keep them to yourself. Like do not tell this person that they need to not transition because of your feelings or whatever. Like don't convince them that they're not a trans man because of your, like, just this isn't about you. Like I know this sounds really I, I hard. But... <laughs> I 100% agree with you, uh, Ben. I I would never uh, tell them that. Um, it's, it's not. I, I don't want to add to their dysphoria. I don't want. I don't want to be a burden to them. I would never tell them not to transition or even even um, suggest that. Um, and like so, what's your point in you, bringing this up? Like, how do you how do you interact with people? that you have a crush on for like for any other, like if you were, if you were attracted to somebody who is a cis woman and they were not interested in you, what would you do with those feelings? Uh, the, the exact same way. I, I, I just don't yeah. bring it so up. So that's it's your answer. That I... Yeah, that's your answer. <laughs> It's a little more cut and I know, dry. It, it's harsh, but it's uh yeah. I'm I'm sorry <laughs> if you were looking for a better explanation, but yeah, it's it's a 
it as a trans person, I mean, great. I obviously it's slightly different from the other perspective, but I've had very similar things before, uh, particularly with like bisexual women who are interested in trans women because they basically want a man who acts like a woman is basically what they're looking for. And it is a disgusting, awful feeling. And I would never wish that upon anyone. Um, I, I think probably the best way to deal with it is to go jerk off. And I'm <laughs> not even being sarcastic, like literally just go jerk off or watch some porn and try to not let it affect your friendship with this person. Yeah, cool. no, I mean, yeah, it, it just. I, I don't know what to tell you, Jay. I, I, I got nothing else for you. Uh, I realize it's not maybe the advice you're looking for. There's not going to be a happy ending with this one. I think Ben said it great. If you are attracted to them as a woman and they're a trans man, you're not attracted to them. You're attracted to an idea of them that you have in your head. Uh, and it's it's conflicting with the reality of the situation. And so you got to reconcile that somehow. And that is not that your friend's problem. And that's about as simple as it gets. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> the, the weird thing is I, I totally agree with you. It just It's just weird to feel this way. And I don't know. What's, what's, weird, what's weird about it? Like, what's weirder about this than having attraction for any other person that you're not going to have a relationship with? Because, uh, because I've, I've always, the, the entire time I've known them, it's, it's been as a man and it's. Yeah. So this sounds like a you problem and not a them problem. Like it, the, it if, if you're looking at problem. a trans, if you're look if you're looking at a trans person that you've never known before their transition and just thinking about what they were like pre-transition, like that's really weird behavior. And like, you just don't, you don't need to think about them like that. Like, I know it, it's hard to just say, like, just stop your thoughts, but like, just, it's just odd that, that, like, this is, I mean, I feel like if, if I had those thoughts about like any other, like, non trans person, like, if, if I looked at people and was like, well, uh, I would really be attracted to the person if they were trans and just like imagined them being trans and like came up with this whole idea in my head of what they would be like as a trans person. It's like, it's kind of weird. And I don't know if you notice how like weird this sounds. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I, I, I get where you're, I get what you're saying. Absolutely. It, All right. Well, I, I don't know if we have yeah. any more inroads here, Jay. I think it, it is genuinely that simple on this issue. And I, I'm sorry you're going to have an unresolved crush, but uh, that that's how this one's <laughs> going to spin out. So uh, like I said, go watch some porn, bust a nut, and move on with your day because that, that's where this one ends, unfortunately, for you. I'm sorry. All right. All right, Jay. I'm going to let you go because... We're getting a lot of dead air, so <laughs> I understand why our answers are usually a lot more uh, leading and open to a conversation, but this one's really that simple. Uh, it, it makes me think of kind of like, I, I want to be careful about this comparison because it could stray into the wrong area, but like when people have like a fetish for someone of like a particular race, like that's always so strange to me because like it invariably has to do with you having expectations about what being with that person is like and having a fantasy built up in your head. And that is almost certainly going to be detached from the reality of that person, which is why mm -hmm. it's considered objectifying, right? That's why the concept of a chaser exists. It's not because being attracted to trans bodies is inherently wrong. It's because usually the kind of people who seek out trans people specifically have expectations and fantasies in their head that they expect that partner to fulfill and not necessarily like, Oh yeah, they're going to do this thing to me. But like you have a fantasy in your head about how that's going to play out. And when it doesn't, you feel let down or resentful towards that person. 
And that's what makes them feel like an object in your fantasy. Uh, but yeah. that's where that one ended. So yeah, <laughs> cut and dry today. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're just going to go in the order that they're taken so far. Uh, let's pull in Elliot in Seattle, Washington. Pronouns are they, them. Elliot, you are live on the line. What's going on? Living the dream. Uh, <laughs> Right on. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. Um, yeah, I uh, I have a question about uh, HRT and various medical conditions that might prevent someone from either going on or staying on HRT. I, I have someone in my life who went on HRT for a period of time, has various uh, um, like physical issues, um, and had to go off of it because of the way that their hormone levels were impacting uh, their conditions. And uh, I, I tried to do some research on this, but just kept finding more information about the impact of HRT in general. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that. And like, as far as I know, a doctor wouldn't prevent someone from going through puberty because of the way that puberty might impact uh, any medical conditions they have. So I'm curious, like how that works, why that's different for trans people. So this isn't, this is a faulty analogy, absolutely faulty analogy, um, because number one, uh, HRT is an additional puberty on top of their uh, endogenous one. Um, and there's a distinct difference with adding medical care or adding an, uh, an intervention versus letting the body endogenously do something. Um, and they're, they're, I mean, these are kind of separate issues entirely of um, what are the risks and benefits with starting HRT or being on HRT, because there definitely are. And, and people who uh, say that there aren't risks of going on it and that you're, everyone's going to be fine and dandy with hormones, it, it's not true. Like there are, this is a medication there are risks with medication. And most of the time people are okay with the risks that they're gonna have and they go on them and they say, I accept whatever risks may come from this intervention. And that's totally fine. Some people um, do not, what, like even if they want to be on HRT, they would rather not have those risks or they have risks that are so significant because of the interactions that it's healthier for them to not do that. Um, and even there are some, some situations that cannot coexist with, uh, HRT, for example, pregnancy and testosterone, like testosterone is a teratogen and can bring significant harm to the fetus. So if someone wants to be pregnant, um, they need to come off of T because of those reasons. But that's again, like somebody that is choosing the risks of pregnancy, uh, over the, the risks of, of HRT. So it's like, you're making your own decisions for your body and all of this uh, direction that you're going to get medically will uh, inevitably come down to what are you comfortable with for your body? And then also what is the provider comfortable with signing off on? Because it's at the end of the day too, it's not just you, like any intervention that they're giving you is on their license and on their conscience. Um, so if like, and, kind of going back to the analogy of, of we wouldn't mess with like a cis person's puberty. That's actually kind of a misleading of a, of a analogy because if somebody's body endogenously is causing them harm, that's the very nature of medicine, right? So like if somebody has, uh, like a, a big example I'm thinking of is if somebody has breast cancer or cervical cancer or uterine cancer that is responsive to estrogen. Like there are like people who will get uh, prophylactic mastectomies to prevent uh, their, their risk of getting this cancer. Uh, and so I could see like, if somebody decides this is too much of a risk, like this is a, uh, this is something that could lead down to, to cancers. Uh, we do intervene on that. Like, and we do suppress people's hormone levels. If mm -hmm. we do think that 
they're going to be at super high risk for that. So we do intervene with cis people mm. uh, and we do intervene with trans people. Like this is just medicine in itself. Are we going to intervene for a, an otherwise healthy person? Well, no, because that's something that's going to come down to that person in their body and them making the decision to then go on hormones. And I can't, I can't give an answer for your friend mm -hmm. and specifically what they're going through um, because I'm not their doctor mm -hmm. and I'm not them. Um, but if, if they're in a situation where the risks of going on HRT or staying on HRT outweighs the, the risks otherwise, then that's, I, I would support their decision. I would hope that their provider is having a, a like having a discussion with the patient and not just making a decision saying you are going to stop HRT or else. Like, I hope that's not the conversation being had. Um, it should be, uh, it should be a team-based effort with that. Um, but there definitely are some mm -hmm. things that I would exercise caution with people going on HRT and that's just with medicine in, in general. Um, I don't know if either of you have other thoughts. No, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that makes sense. And, and I get that. I guess I like, whatever, we don't have to get into it, but yeah, I get that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, okay. Elliot. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Yeah. I apologize if my bluntness. No, I apologize great. if my bluntness is is scaring people off from having a discussion. Um, no, it's fine. I I'm cur I mean, I probably should have asked the caller. If we don't have to get into it, but if somebody says we don't have to get into it, I'm assuming that means I don't want to, and I'm not gonna like pressure someone after that. But uh, yeah, I'm curious what what they had else to respond to that because that seems to me mm -hmm. to be just kind of generic medicine mindset and i uh, so i didn't have anything to add like yeah there are some situations where the the risks are going to outweigh the benefits and that's just how all well, medicine works literally ever uh yeah and and this is a, a conversation going into medical ethics of like beneficence versus non-maleficence versus autonomy and like I think the majority of people are in the camp that autonomy is going to trump everything else and that like if if you can if you can adequately like give informed consent then that's going to be the driving factor um mm -hmm. but that is again like something that is going to go on the provider's license and needs to be considered in, in that maybe that particular provider isn't comfortable um, giving hormones to this person for this with this condition, but somebody else might be. Um, and and of course, like if there's something that you want to do for your body that isn't medically recommended, um, there's definitely there's probably going to be some pushback from that provider saying like, "Hey, this is not recommended. Here's the risks that I see with this." Um, and like, it's important to be aware of that. And they're probably going to be firm in their stance. And it's not necessarily trying to prevent you from going on that thing. Um, it, it's like, like they, they don't want to take away your ability to make that decision, but like, they're trying to give you as much information as possible. Because like the last thing we want is for you to have that autonomous decision and then have a regret because you had a complication that we told you about that you might have. But people oftentimes don't recognize that those complications are real things that can happen. And people think, oh, that's a risk that happens rarely. It's not going to happen to me. But it can very, very likely happen to you, uh, depending on the statistics. So just be aware that the conversation might not be as smooth as you perceive it. And it's not necessarily a you problem. It's just trying to make sure everybody is on the same page. Cool. Uh, yes. Great. I, I'm going to defer to the doctor on, <laughs> on the medical related question. Uh, all right. We're going to move on to uh, caller number five. I'm probably not in the as good of a mindset to handle the similar call as last week. 
but we're going to do our best. Hannah in Europe, uh, you are live on Transatlantic. What do you want to talk about today? Hello? Hannah, if you are there, you might be muted. All right, going once, going twice. All right, we're going to return Hannah to the queue. Uh, You're not gone. We'll try to take you later and give you a chance to sort that out. Also, to the call screener, if you're not busy, uh, if you could grab uh, Hannah and help them figure out, help her figure out her audio issue, that would be great. Uh, but don't rush. Do what you're doing. Uh, let's pull in. Uh, okay. Oh boy, this one sounds intense. Let's pull in Jennifer in Canada. Pronouns are she and they. Jennifer, you are live on the line. What's going on? Hello, uh, I'm Jennifer. I live in Ottawa. Um, Hi. My problem that I'm having this moment is that my boyfriend, who's been gone for a month and a half, are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, yes. sorry. Um, uh, my boyfriend, who's been gone for a month uh, and a bit to Halifax, um, while he was gone, I came out as a trans woman and started all the processes with, um, but he identifies as a, um, a trans man who is only attracted to cis men. And mm. my problem is, is that I love him, but that we've sort of been battling back and forth of, you know, my process and how this is going to go. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Um, so is there like a, a specific advice question you're looking for in there? I mean, that's good context for the situation you're in. Um, and I, get, I have lots of thoughts about it, but I was wondering if there's maybe more of a question there. It sounds like maybe you're leading up to a more pinnacle point. Well, is it possible to make it so that we're together still? Um, I love him very much. We've been together for two years. And up until now, I've sort of like hinted a little bit at the prospect, but the problem has been so far that when I looked in the mirror, I didn't see a woman. I saw like a cis man. And so, you know, while he was gone, I sort of did a lot of introspection. And when I did that, it sort of, I sort of came across my trans identity but then it, it's now thrown sort of like my, my life into whack. And I'm sort of worried not only about sort of my ability to uh, keep my love life intact in this way, but also about loneliness and mm. the fact that I'm not going to pass for a while. And so partnership will be difficult to come across. Yeah. So I'm sort of more I mean, wondering if like, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, this is not, not exactly, uh, encouraging, but I'm, I'm a trans man who passes and I'm still lonely. So it won't, <laughs> it won't necessarily. <laughs> answer that. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a nice morbid little cap there. I, I would say yeah. I, I have a lot of feelings on this because this makes me think of something I actually it was kind of brought up recently. Uh, I Someone was talking about uh, an experience of being a trans woman and having your a partner who is a cis man or who you thought was a cis man uh, come out as trans to you. And it totally makes sense to me that somebody who's in the closet or like an egg might really appreciate a trans partner because that gives them the room to finally explore their own gender identity. 100% I understand and empathize with that being in that situation. I will say though, I think as trans people, it's sometimes uh, our partner's identity and their orientation with regard to where we are can 
really have an impact on how you see yourself. And so it, it's one of those situations where like, I, I, you guys have been together for two years. I want to root for you, right? I mm. want you guys to be happy and be in love and to stay together if that's what's right. But at the same time, I really do understand the position of, you know, like if my partner came out to me as a trans woman, I, I would have to leave. For me personally, I, I would not be able to if I started dating a trans woman, that would be a lot easier for me. But there's so much about myself in relation to your partner that it it really is. It's it's a very loaded situation. And I I think I I, I don't know if there's like a right answer here, you know, but I, I just I feel like I empathize with where both of y'all are coming from. Like you absolutely deserve the right to to explore yourself and to transition if that's what you want and to actualize into who you are. You shouldn't be stopping that because your partner wants a cis man. But at the same time, I do really understand where they're coming from and why that would be a really difficult thing to cope with. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I don't really know how to say uh, or what advice is right other than to just say, like, I, I'm really sorry you're in that situation. And I empathize with where both of you are coming from deeply. And I hope that y'all are able to navigate to a place where you can both be happy with whatever outcome there is. Um, cause it yeah, really me too. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I find frustrating is that it's just not, it's, it's at, at what point, in my mind, am I thinking like, are you in love with my gender identity or are you in love with me? And mm. sort of, you know, like, is it that you're chasing euphoria through what I was or are you, you know, like, what is like, what, like, cause I came out, like I started as a gay man and then I came out as pan and then I came out as non-binary and then that didn't fit. And then I came out as, as a trans woman and their reaction was like, well, this is over. But now we've sort of like walked it to this sort of like weird zone where we're not separated. Like things are not over, but it's sort of like, and like they're making plans, like we're going to the Dominican in January and stuff. But I'm just wondering if this is just doomed and I should sort of pre prepare for like this being over or if this is like one of those sort of like exploration things, you know, like I don't, I think I'm just sort of wondering yeah. if there's like a way that I could like walk it forward, you know? I, I don't, I can't, I couldn't tell you if it's doomed, right? I mean, I don't know how anyone could know that, but what I can tell you is that I think the best thing that you can do to get to either the place where y'all are happy and worked through this or you are separated and that's the, what's best for both of you is for you to just say, look, regardless of how you feel about my identity, this is who I am. This is the fact. You just need mm. to really put it all out there, honestly, as who you are unapologetically and to maybe prepare yourself for the chance that that is going to be a factor that's going to end the relationship and to be okay with the fact that if your partner is you know as you put it maybe more into uh more attracted to the euphoria of being with a man uh than necessarily you as an individual I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that either I think that's well within his right but I do think yeah it, it's yeah, as a situation where I think the, the best thing that you can really do is to just be like, hey, look, I love you. I want to work this out. I want to be together. That's what I want for this. But also, I'm not going to compromise on me being me because you like this other version of me. And really, of all the people, a trans partner should be understanding of that. And, you know, as hard as it is to be OK with whatever that means for the for the outcome of the relationship. Um yeah. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense the way you're saying it now, but it, it's funny because when I, when I first came out to him and he had that reaction, I was pretty fucking mean to him. Um, mm. And I made like a statement that was pretty mean spirited. I told him that all trans men leave their trans women. And uh, he got really upset by that. 
of course. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I'm just sort of like in this weird hurt, sort of upset, you know, like, cause this is someone that I've like really invested time with and really like put a lot of effort into making them happy and making us happy together. And, you know, it's, it feels, you know, like in my mind, the me is still the same. Like I'm still going to be me. I'm just going to sort of feminize myself a bit and sort of get to a point in my transition where I'll look a little different, but I'll still be myself, you know? And, and, you know, you're right. It's, it's, uh, you know, like it's entirely up to them as well. And, you know, I, I guess I'm just sort of like a little frustrated is all. If I could give some insight. And coming out has been a little rough, so. No, I absolutely coming out is always going to be hard and it's harder when you have a partner in this situation. If I could give some insight that may or may not be useful. uh, When I say if my partner came out as a trans woman, I would have to leave. It's not because in my mind, from my perspective, it's not because I'm with him for the euphoria of being in like a perceptively heterosexual relationship. I'm, pansexual or bisexual or whatever you want to call it. I don't really care about the label. Uh, Right. It's more because that makes me kind of feel like similar to the caller we were having earlier. Like I I wasn't really like my partner wasn't attracted to me or into a relationship with me because they wanted a relationship with the, with me as an individual. It makes me feel kind of objectified. Like I was just a tool, like a stepping stone on the path for you to discover yourself. And you kind of like used me in that way is how I would feel. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's accurate or that that's a, a reasonable response, but that that's how it would make me feel. Um, and mm. I've kind of been in a similar situation before and it, that was pretty much what it made me feel. And yeah, I, it's, it's a really difficult thing. I, it's hard because I, I'm definitely the kind of person who's, you know, a bit of a, whatever makes you happy in a relationship is really the end all, right? Like you should, if this is what makes you happy in a relationship, you should be allowed to go for that. If you don't like this in a relationship, you shouldn't have to have that or whatever. But yeah, yeah, I think the best thing really you can do is just, just to lay it out there and be like, you know, maybe uh, this isn't about you. <laughs> maybe you kind of pad around the the hurtful statement you might've done earlier about like, oh, all trans men leave their trans women and be like, okay, look, this is not about that. You know, I said that and I was angry yeah. and upset and I'm, maybe you're still angry and upset and that's okay. But this is about you feeling like you need to be you and like you really wanting to stay with this person and wanting that to be the outcome, but understanding that that might not be the outcome considering you have to be yourself. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it, I, I mean, I, it's kind of weird, right? Because he's not even here. Like he's gone for the next month and a half. So, you know, it's... Mm sort of like we're not even able to have these kind of conversations and sit down and be like and hash it out. But I feel as though if he was here, he would just be gone. That'd be it. But now that he's not here, he sort of had some time to think about it, but it's it's really weird. We're in like a really weird situation. Like he's even like making plans. Like we're going to Dominican on, you know, in January. And it's like, you know, like, like, should I be looking for a roommate? Like, you know, like, what the fuck am I doing here? So it's just sort of, you know, I, I'm just sort of in like a really weird limbo frustration land. So. Yeah. No, that sounds really difficult. Yeah. I, I I hope you're able to get some resolution soon. Um, I don't know what the best move is <laughs> going forward, Jennifer. I don't, I don't know, know if it's don't. call him and like hash it out or wait till he gets home and do it in person. It's uh, it's hard, and I'm I'm no, sorry. I, relationships ending is, I think, also for trans people in a way. I mean, obviously, relationships ending is hard for absolutely everyone, but I think a lot of times trans people can really put a lot of our self worth in being wanted by a partner, since we kind of live in a society that seems to not want us at times, and uh, it, it's difficult. And I'm I'm sorry you're in that position. It sounds really challenging, and I, I hope you're able to work things out. Well, I just think it's kind of funny because like my relationship not ending because of some kind of failing of the relationship. It's like a compatibility issue. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. And, th- and that's, and that's how you but, need to frame it. Right. Like it, this isn't like, I, I I'd be careful unless you have like solid evidence that this is about you being a trans person. Like this, it does come down to more than likely a compatibility issue. Like this is somebody with a certain like romantic or sexual preference and like Mm -hmm. if you're not compatible then you just might not be compatible and it's like it's not it might not be uh, uh, against you personally like this person just might have certain things that they want in a like in a sexual romantic partner and you might not meet meet that anymore and that's just something you learn in relationships and and sometimes you go a long time before you learn that you're not compatible and that's like i would encourage you to i i know that this is difficult and there's a lot to process here um but i hope that you're able to not feel like all all of the baggage is on you like there's the relationships are complicated yeah mm-hmm. uh yeah with that jennifer I'm, I'm not sure we can give much more advice and we do have other callers on the line so i think we're gonna have to let you go but um if fair enough would love to hear if you have, uh, you know, if this hashes out and you have more thoughts. Uh, love to hear back from you sometime. I have, I have one last thing to say. Sure. Uh, part of my coming out was because of like you and people like Matt. And uh, hmm. thanks. Well, so, I'm glad I was able to help. Watching you. a long time, so. Bye. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye. Best of luck. Bye. Oh, all right. Uh, so I see Hannah's back on the line and I do want to take her. So we'll take her next. But real quick, mm-hmm. uh, I have to do my job here as a host on the line. Uh, well, so if you don't know, I know it's crazy to think, but Transatlantic is not the only show on this channel. Uh, we are only here on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time. There's actually a whole bunch of shows and there are more new shows coming down the pipeline. So uh, if you would like to subscribe, you could catch things like the Sunday show at 2 p.m. Central Time with Jimmy Snow and Matt Dillahunty this week talking about uh, religion and atheism and all that good stuff. On Monday is going to be Skeptalk Talk with John Gleason and Dr. Aaron Adair. Uh, Skeptalk Talk is usually a show where our hosts talk about whatever they're specialized in. So it can kind of be up to whatever the hosts or guest hosts are uh, into. So that'll be hopefully an interesting conversation. I'm not familiar with Dr. Adair, but go check that out. Uh, on Tuesday is going to be Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock and Seth Andrews. I'm sure that'll be great. Uh, on next Wednesday is going to be Matt Dillahunty and prospectively J. Mike as of right now. Although I don't think I've confirmed that. I got to message him. And then next week, it's going to be back again with myself and Katie Montgomery. So uh, if you would like to see all that awesome stuff, it's going to be great. Hit subscribe. And uh, also, one last thing, the best way to support us is over on our Patreon, patreon.com slash call the line. Uh, we are trying to do so many awesome things to keep the lights on here, to, you know, make sure our hosts are getting paid for their time, to do things like LionCon, where we could have a convention where we do all of our shows live and bring you guys in to watch Uh that would be something we need money for. And to do that, we need your support. So go to patreon.com slash call the lion and uh, support us there. Anyway, let's get Hannah back on the line. Hannah, you are live. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, oh thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for taking my call. I heard you Arden say on one of the previous shows that you would love for someone to call in and ask you your opinion about neo pronouns and I am actually very interested in both of your opinions about it. I am queer. I uh, a, a few years ago had gotten out of a very radical sect and I've been doing my best to relearn the world and uh my uh, own identity and so I at this moment this is like a a little thing I am I've been wondering about these neo pronouns I have mixed feelings about it and and I would like to I've spoken to a few people about it um 
also queer people, and uh, they also seem to have mixed feelings about it. So I just don't know what to think. And I would love for someone to educate me a little bit more, if that's possible. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how much educating I can do. I, I don't think there's like an objective neo-pronoun stance, but I can tell you what my thoughts are and how it makes me feel, because I, so I, I think I have my feelings are also mixed. Like, I want to start by saying how I feel about someone's pronouns does not indicate whether or not they are valid or whether or not I would use them. Um, it, all it indicates is maybe a, a perspective on language and how it makes me feel personally. I'm not saying anyone's pronouns are invalid or that I am the arbiter of that or anything like that. So just get that out of the way quickly. Uh, sure. Now, my I think my thing that was so with some neo pronouns like I, I don't know if it. I, in my mind, it it just would classify as a neo pronoun because it's not it's not typically used for people. It's usually an impersonal pronoun, so that kind of counts. That's a little bit easier for me because it it's is within the English language, and it is commonly used in those places grammatically where it's really not like a shift psychologically that has to happen to adapt that. For me, the thing that I struggle with is that the purpose of pronouns is supposed to be a generic, short way to refer to as many people as possible. Uh, it's supposed to be a catch-all word that can refer to a group of people so that you don't have to use someone's name all the time. Because it would sound ridiculous if I was saying, ah, Ben said this and Ben did that and Ben did that. If I was using his name all the time, it would start to sound super awkward, which is why pronouns like he exists. Or, you know, for non-binary people, there's they and it's and all these other things. I think my yeah. issue is more for when when pronouns are so new that it start, starts to become an expect. No, I, I, okay, I'm going to say what I'm going to say and then I'm going to also caveat it. Because this is a loaded conversation and people rightly might be upset. And I, I want to leave room for that because this is a controversial topic. Uh, I think when people start using neo-pronouns, it can often be an expectation of, where it ceases to be a pronoun to me. It becomes a, a nickname, effectively, uh, is, is the, like in practice. Because you're no longer using a catch-all term to refer to large groups of people without using their name. You have a specific term that I use for you in that situation, which to me is pretty indistinguishable from a nickname. Um, now, that said, uh, oh man, I had, a, I had a caveat. Oh, that was so important for that. Um, oh, right. Yes. Yes. That being said, there are lots of languages and we've talked about that on this show that like, you know, in French and Spanish where things are heavily gendered, uh, it, people need to, uh, learn to adapt their language to be able to refer to people. And I do think that the only way we're going to progress to a place where, you know, non-binary people can feel like the language actually refers to them is to adopt these and to start changing them. But I think it has to be weighed with sort of similar to the caller we had last week, defending it, it's pronouns where they basically said, uh, sort of any and all pronouns kind of work. Uh, I prefer it. It's, but I also make room for the fact that the way my pronouns are might make people feel some kind of way. And so I kind of have these, this room for exceptions, but I really prefer the people who know me and care about me to make more of an effort. Like that is an expectation that I think is fair to hold. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of black and white opinions on neo-pronouns. Like all neo-pronouns are valid and there should be no argument about it all the way to like neo-pronouns just shouldn't exist. And I don't think either of those are anywhere close to correct. I think the real truth of it lies in the fact that adapting language is uncomfortable and takes a lot of time. And the way that we integrate them is also going to have an impact on their effectiveness, how long they stay around, uh, how easy it is for people to adapt that in their language. Um, yeah, so I, I'm sorry that that was kind of a very loaded and full of caveats, but I, I think it's important to have this conversation be as nuanced as possible because all of the convert, all the dialogue that I see around neo-pronouns tends to be very black and white. And I think the situation calls for a much more 
uh, a nuanced conversation. So that, that's kind of where I'm at. Ben, I don't know if, how, where, you're, where you're at with neo pronouns. <laughs> or if you don't want to answer, I, that's also I, valid. Well, no, I, I think I agree with Arden's take on this. I'm going to admit that I haven't spent a whole lot of time in discussions about this. Um, so I'm kind of going to, uh, I'm, I'm not really going to weigh in a whole lot on this just because I, I don't feel as informed on the topic. Um, so I'm just going to defer. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, okay, I, thank you. Yeah, did, did you have anything you wanted to add or was that just kind of? Uh, uh, I just, well, I mean, I actually agree with you, both of you. And, uh, you know, when I think about, uh, I think specifically even just pronouns that just don't exist. Uh, pronouns that are invented. So recently I joined this Discord server, which had uh, a number of pronouns I've never heard before. Like, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce these pronouns. <laughs> okay. uh, they, I think it's something like Zizer or something like that. I don't know, but there's, yeah. there was a few more. I, I don't know how they are being pronounced. So, but um, I just found that to be... Uh, like I basically agree with you both. I I find that it's it it would be very it could be very difficult to implement a pronouns to to expect someone to implement pronouns that basically don't exist in the language currently. Of course, the fact that something doesn't exist in the language doesn't mean that it that it shouldn't ever come right. to existence. <laughs> I just, I just mean that it, it would be quite complicated when everyone would basically be would be free to um invent their own pronoun and you know expect everyone to use it especially when i think about my own native language uh it's more complicated i would say with all the conjugations and declensions and all of that stuff and uh, it would be especially difficult in my language to implement a pronoun that just someone came up with and asked me to now implement it in every sentence. I would have an extremely difficult time. I can just imagine I would be so stressed out about it. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's not that I don't want to respect someone. That's not at all what I'm saying. Uh, and It's just that I, I find I would have a very difficult time being able to implement that way of um, communicating. And I just, I wonder if that's really necessary, if if that's something that someone absolutely needs to feel validated. You know, I still, I am always open. I will continue thinking about this and uh, continue exploring this topic. And um, yeah, I don't know, is that, is that, um, an exhaustive answer. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a pretty thorough answer. And we, we had a caller back when the show first started who was talking about uh, how he refused to use any of the adaptations. Uh, to, I don't remember if he was French. I feel like he was French um, that were being proposed for non-binary people in that language where it was not as accessible to use a gender neutral pronoun. And I remember the, the mm -hmm. conversation went somewhere along the lines of like, well, you know, to some degree, tough shit. Like, you do have to learn to adapt language. And to be clear, mm -hmm. like I said, I feel that way about me too. It makes me uncomfortable, and I think it doesn't really sound like a pronoun at that point. That doesn't mean that I'm going to not try to use it, but it does mm -hmm. mean it's going to be difficult and uncomfortable, and I might mentally stumble to the point where I say they, them, or something that's also neutral alternatively in that moment. Um but yeah, I think mm -hmm. language changes. It just, it, it takes, when I told that guy tough shit, it wasn't because I was like, no, you have to be comfortable using it and do it perfectly now. No, that's not the point. The point is we need to have a patient, nuanced approach to these things where we understand that language evolves. Language is always changing. We wouldn't have different languages if language didn't, you know, metaphorically evolve. Uh, and it's going to continue to do so, and probably in a way that's inclusive of neo-pronouns. I just think 
mm. the conversation needs to be a little bit more nuanced than what it usually is in the public sphere. But I appreciate you calling in, Hannah, and I appreciate you uh, doing it gently because I suspect future callers might not be so kind with my position. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I've never called into it anything like this before so that was a very interesting experience for me and thank you also for being gentle with me and i hope um yeah i hope to continue to be educated and to be able to understand better the things i might not be able to understand now yeah likewise love that message all right have a nice one Hannah. we'll talk sl- talk later thank you bye. bye uh i did see chat kind of kind of getting a little little spice uh but that's fair people are gonna have strong feelings about this and i invite y'all to call in and to let us have this discussion because these are some of the things that like make online discourse frustrating for me is uh oh let me get this chiron down uh is when there are these topics that are important to people and really do affect people's well-being and like all the things that I said, language does change and evolve and you do to some extent just have to kind of get the fuck over it. Um, but also I think there has to be a little bit more of a dialogue and more of room for these things to grow rather than uh, just kind of setting them down and expecting it to just be that way. And I don't think most people who use neo pronouns do that, right? I, I Every person who I've ever met who uses neo pronouns usually says this one and they, and, or acknowledges that I don't expect people to just use it. I just want people to, and that's totally a valid perspective as well. I'm not trying to shit on that. I just am hoping to gray out the dialogue a little bit into more of an accurate perspective, but, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's see. We're at 317. Whew. Um, okay, so we have five calls on the line, and we're probably going to have only time to get to, like, one more. Um, yep. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, how about we take call number six, Tyler, because I feel like that could be... Yeah. We've done it a lot, but it mm-hmm. could be a good educating opportunity. So we're going to take call number six, Tyler, in Oklahoma. And uh, I'm going to mute you really quick, Tyler, not because you've done anything wrong, but just because I want to do a quick message to everyone else in the line uh, who's on the line currently. We are unfortunately out of time today, so we're not going to be able to get to anyone else. To all of you who've waited on the line, I'm really sorry. It's the nature of call-in shows. Not everyone gets taken. Uh, I invite you to call back in another week, call in earlier, and we will do our best to get to you uh, then. But until then, our last caller for today is going to be Tyler in Oklahoma. You are unmuted. Go ahead, Tyler. Hey guys. Um, yeah, just, I guess a pretty straightforward question. I was wondering, uh, either of your opinions and just the, I guess, trans community opinion on children transitioning. And I guess I consider children, you know, we could just say like under 18 or maybe like under 15. Sure. So this is not as straightforward of a question as maybe you think it is. Um, because when we say children, and uh, you're bringing in a very wide range uh, for people under 18 or under 15, either one is a very broad category with very uh, distinct kind of uh, divisions of ages throughout that. Like even when we're looking at a pediatric population, we have very different ways of looking at children uh, under age one, children under age two, under age four, under age six, like there's a lot of subdivisions within pediatric populations. And then on the other hand too, when talking about transition, like what specific aspects of transition are you wanting to talk about? Because uh, we, when we talk about transition for children, uh, it's developmentally appropriate is the goal. 
Uh, and that looks very different for all of these different age groups. Like if uh, we've talked a lot about people finding their gender identity often at ages three or four years old. I will never ever recommend hormones for a child of three or four years old because that's ridiculous. They're not developmentally ready for something like that, but um, they might be ready to have their hair a certain way. They might be ready to wear clothes a certain way. They might be ready to engage in certain activities. And like, I don't think anybody, at least most reasonable people would not argue with children being able to choose the clothes they want to wear choose the hairstyle they want to have. Like that's a lot less controversial than this conversation often leads to. And so even though this seems like a straightforward question, it's really not a straightforward question. There's so many nuances to this. Um, and oftentimes when we talk about things like a medical transition, even in populations under age 18, they're of ages where it's developmentally appropriate for them to start undergoing these things. Um, like the kind of the younger ages that you'd be starting hormones is around 13 or 14, which, yeah, there's some debate about when are you old enough to make decisions for yourself? And there isn't a solid answer on that because humans are different. And the way that we've defined adult in our society isn't even really biologically based so much as it is socially based. Like this is an age that we've defined as the majority of the population has decision-making capacity by this age. Um, and so that's a number that we, we've gone with. It's, it's a guesstimated average at best. Um, but are there younger people that can make decisions and, and we could confidently let them? Like, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's just more of an individual basis. And when we're making those decisions medically for somebody, um, we have individualized decisions. So I think it's, it's reasonable for you to ask these questions, but I guess I have some more questions in return of what specific part of this question are you wanting to discuss or wanting to debate? Because I think if we don't clarify where we're defining these ranges or where we're defining the question, we could just be talking past each other and not not even be speaking about the same issue. So um, do you have a bit more clarity on where you want to go with this? Um, I'm Honestly, I'm pretty uneducated and this is why I was calling. Um, but I guess to hone in on more specifically, if, like, let's say a law was passed that said um, <clears throat> children only this age or above are allowed to transition, would you, what age would you put on that? So, like, we do the same thing with, like, alcohol well, or cigarettes or something, right? That's the problem, that that's still very nebulous. And, again, mm -hmm. what type of transition are we talking about? Because if you're saying people can't transition at all, you're then banning people from social transition, which is the majority of transitions that happen. Um, and can a law even be put in place that says, hey, you can't dress the way you want to? Like, that's a huge human rights problem. Like, that's a huge First Amendment okay. problem. That, that's a problem on so many levels. Um, but then taking it to uh, who should be allowed to medically transition, and then, too, we're still in a right. sticky place because then you are determining who is allowed to receive what medical care and you are overriding the the discretion of a physician and their patient um so i mean just legally speaking all of that is just sticky but to frame it as as ambiguously as should people be allowed to transition and at what age like i again that just gives me more questions than answers like it's not it's not a clear debate topic and that's why i think people use that language because it's so ambiguous that you can move the goalpost whenever you want and still be right based on the definitions that you never defined. So I don't know if Arden wants to jump in. Yeah. I, the only thing I would have to add is that I, I wouldn't really support any law that banned a medical treatment in that way. Like I, what I want is for doctors to use evidence-based guidelines in giving medicine and for politicians who don't know anything about medicine to stay the fuck out of it. Uh, I, I would like people to receive 
age appropriate evidence based medical intervention uh, with the support of their parents and a physician who is educated. Kind of where I'm at. Okay, I guess I wasn't understanding the nomenclature exactly. I guess I'm specifically talking about what would be medical or chemical change. I don't care if someone wants to wear okay. so, like a, sh- a different shirt right. or so something. Again, I don't think they'll wash it. So, so, so again, though, again, though, should should a politician or should the common public be allowed to tell you and your doctor what is healthy for you? <clears throat> like, like, let's say you needed some medication for chest pain. Like if let's say you're having chest pain and uh, you go to the emergency department and they say, yeah, uh, you're going to need to take aspirin and a beta blocker and this other stuff. Um, can politicians can and should politicians say, uh, actually, I don't think so. Like, should they be involved in this decision at all? Well, I think that's a little different because things like that are pretty like no, if it's I not. have my arm cut off. Right? No, it's not. It's- no, it's not. This Talk is to a doctor, the exact the same. Is I I am a physician. Are you talking about do you do you medicine? see a difference between psychology and like let's like a psychological evaluation or if I'm just evaluating if your arm's cut off or something? Do you see a difference between those two things? They are both they are both medical evaluations. One involves what's inside the brain, the other one involves what's outside mm-hmm. the brain. That's kind of a, a difference as far as which specialist you're going to bring in as the expert. Um, but it's still, we use medicine to treat things that are going on inside your brain, right? Is that not true? Like, I, I just confused about why you think your opinion matters on somebody else's health care. Like, that's really uh, absolutely confusing to me. No, I'm not trying to put my opinion on it. I'm, de- I'm definitely not qualified to, like, make a you know right so what makes politicians have to be a certain age well, so what makes politicians educated enough to make that decision why can't you leave this up to the the physicians um who set these guidelines uh okay, well not to say i trust i don't trust the politicians either um so don't you know i definitely believe the do- a doctor some someone with medical expertise should determine these things so i'm just not certain if uh yeah okay so you believe people with medical expertise should be the ones to determine these things i'm going to tell you right now have you ever heard of the american medical association yes how about the american heart association yes okay well those and pretty much every major medical association within the united states and internationally supports what I told you at the beginning of this call and what Ben has been saying. Age-appropriate, evidence-based medical health care. Uh, every medical organization is on board with trans health care. And if you want to know the specifics of what medicalized health care looks like for trans youth, we can talk about that. But that's a different conversation from what should be allowed. Uh, because what should be allowed is what the evidence supports, which is children in some cases, in many cases, accessing medical treatment when it's appropriate at the right age, uh, whatever intervention the doctor, who is a professional, following the evidence, seems to think is right. Okay, so it's, it sounds like it's what you're kind of both saying is maybe just specifically case by case basis. Forget age, really. Yeah. Just in evaluation and whatever the evaluation ends up being would be, you know, where you'd go. Yeah. And that that's for all medicine too. That's not even trans people, right? In, in all medicine, it should be, a, a, you're obviously informed by the data and what you're seeing in populations, but when you're treating an individual patient, you're not going to be like, well, you know, you're presenting with these symptoms or, you know, what th- whatever this is going on, but at the population level, that makes me think I shouldn't treat you. No, no. Doctors treat individual patients. Uh, and actually Ben, is the one who taught me the word for this specific fallacy. But there's fallacies regarding when you do that sort of logic going both ways. Whereas the ecological fallacy, I believe I'm getting this right, is when you apply population level statistics to an individual. And there's also one in reverse, when you suggest because an individual is a certain way, that must be representative of the population, right? So all medicine is individual based. To say that 
children should not access <clears throat> medical care or transition care. Let's be specific about what we're talking about. To say children shouldn't access transition care is not informed by the evidence and is making a decision for individuals based on, like, they want to pretend it's based on a population, but it's not even. That's not even what the population level statistics show. The population level statistics show that transition care overwhelmingly improves the quality of life of trans people and that misdiagnoses, situations where people might be diagnosed as trans and start transitioning and then realize it's wrong for them and detransition, that that's exceedingly rare. And even when it does happen, which happened to me, I transitioned, detransitioned, and then realized that I detransitioned because society was so fucking hostile to trans people that I actually was trans. I just detransitioned so I wouldn't be harassed all the time. The majority of people who detransition right. end up <clears throat> transitioning again in the future. So misdiagnoses are exceedingly rare. So why would we not? And this is e the evidence shows this like very clearly. So why would we not put all of this decision making power in the hands of the experts? Why would we e implement any law regarding this for an entire population of people, especially when it is in direct contrast to all of the evidence? I guess, and I guess this is my like bias or my fear. Whenever I hear someone say like, oh yeah, they were 13 in transition. I'm just like, my, my goodness. I, you know, I hope this kid is okay. That seems just so young to me. But if what you guys are saying is no, I mean, maybe, maybe not a doctor evaluated them and this 13 year old is like exceptionally mature and ready for this. Then, I mean, my opinion, yeah, I, I guess nobody, opinion nobody is, is handing, the doctor says so. nobody is handing out medications to children like they're candy like there's a right. distinct difference too in how we approach transition from a medical standpoint with adults versus children like the amount of evaluation that goes into like pediatric transition is extensive like there are so many hoops to jump through and that's for safety reasons um and so it's problematic to assert that children are undergoing this informed consent model because they're not like that's an exclusively adult thing because you have to have the uh, decision-making capacity to say yes i accept the risks of this decision and i take full responsibility for that decision and that's a thing an adult can do a child cannot do that um, so we have a lot more steps and a lot more evaluation for a a child to go through to get to that point and so I think that's something that we're missing is like, when you say, like, when we say we support children to transition, we are supporting the de decision that is being made with going through the necessary steps to be safe about it. Right? Yeah. Like, so we're assuming that those steps are there. And then the debate, the debate then is not whether or not should this be allowed. The debate is for the experts to have of, is this the safest way to go about it? Can we improve upon the process that we currently have? And that's a discussion that experts are going to have. That's not really much in the conversation of, of everyday public, but that's also the same discussion we're having with every other medical issue. Like we're like the, the PR we put out to the public about like diabetes and heart disease and all that, like there's a limited set of information and discussion that the common public is having. Behind the scenes, we are having lots of debate about the best way to manage diabetes. Like this isn't just a universally agreed upon thing with every case all the time. Like, no, there are constant papers coming out, constant reevaluations of the standards of care, of the guidelines. And you make decisions based on the, the knowledge of that time. And it's like, so I, I think even bringing a lot of the more nuanced discussion into the public sphere is kind of harmful because you all are not seeing what really goes into these discussions for every other health issue on this planet. Um, so I hope that kind of helps a little bit. I also wanted to ask something, Tyler, because you said like, oh, they're 13. Like, how could they make that decision? But like, Tyler, when you were 13, right. <clears throat> I, I don't know if you're gay or straight or bi or whatever. Did, did you know if you liked girls or boys? Yeah, I, I mean, and this is just anecdotal, but yeah, for me, I distinctly remember sitting in kindergarten and I like wanted to sit by a, a girl and I always remember the uh, teacher caught me sitting in the wrong spot. Yeah, I, I liked girls uh -huh. and boys when I was little. I remember. And did you 
know you were a boy? Did I know I was a boy? I mean, like, I, did you have doubts about being was a boy? boy as much as, was there any controversy oh, no, for you in your life no. regarding being a boy? No. Mm-hmm. Right. Which to me would indicate that you were pretty well aware that you were a boy and pretty confident in that fact. For trans people, we generally experience, uh, and not everyone experiences necessarily conflict over it, but generally we also have an awareness of our gender. And when you're cis, it's really easy to be like, well, I, I mean, I don't know if I really knew because there's no conflict for you in existing in the world. For trans people, we become aware of it specifically because, well, not specifically because, but for a lot of us, because we hit barriers where my awareness of my gender, I was aware of my gender from a very young age, but I couldn't articulate to you I was a girl. Everyone told me I was a boy. But when I went to school and I was like, I, I kind of want to hang out with the girls though. And I kind of want to paint my nails and grow my hair long. But every time I do that, I am bullied and chastised by adults. It became very apparent that there was something about me that was very different from all my peers. And by 13, I was aware that I was trans and I had come out to my mom by the time I was 14. I was aware of my gender. There was no controversy regarding my gender. Because for most people, you're aware of who you are with those terms, boy or girl, non-binary, or your sexuality, from an extremely young age. The barriers that stop people from accessing that knowledge and that information are entirely the social expectations that we put upon people. Well, you were born with a penis, so you have to have short hair and like fishing and throwing sports balls and talking shit with your bros. And those are the things that cause people to like have conflict with these things, right? If we just told people, hey, whatever you are, it's cool. You know, if you are a boy or a girl or you're non-binary or maybe you're figuring it out and you're not entirely sure, that's okay. Because at the end of the day, as long as you are a happy, healthy, productive member of society, it doesn't matter what the fuck your gender is. People would come to those things so much more easily and with so much less conflict. Like people would not have to have a coming out stage or a awakening of their gender. You would just live it and be aware of it like every other person is for all of time. Like, it's not remarkable that a 13-year-old knows that they're trans. It's like, if anything, that is the age that I would expect people to start becoming very aware of their transness because it's one thing to have blockages and walls regarding your gender when you're interacting with your peers or your family, but it's an entirely different, and for me, it was an entirely terrifying prospect When I was about 13 and realized I was starting to go through puberty and I wasn't going to look like my mom when I grew up, I was going to look like my fucking dad. That was a fire under my ass to figure that out like no other. Uh, I think 13 is exactly the age that a lot of people are going to become exceedingly aware of their gender. Got it. I, I guess I haven't thought about, um, you know, the way I saw my own gender is just the same way anyone else would see theirs. I mean, I don't give a shit if you want to transition or be gay or whatever. That doesn't bother me. I'm just, uh, it, so I guess uh, like what Dr. Ben was saying, um, these like younger age transitions are really rare and doctors are doing a ton of testing and I don't know exactly what's going on, but the media makes me think like, oh man, we're just transitioning all these kids all the time. But in reality, I guess, you know, that's just not true. No, there are guidelines and people are following the evidence in reality, but the media definitely wants you to feel that way because you know what that does? Fear of harming children has historically been a very effective tool at marginalizing people and helping people, hegemonic forces, people in power, to cement their power further. It happened with race. It happened with homosexuality. It's happened with, you know, marginalized religions before, and it's happening with trans people now. And it, it's, it, it's fucked up. And it's to buy into it is to feed into the time old conspiracy of what about the children? Okay. What about the trans children? Right. The consequences right. of your actions <clears throat> who will harm 
who will have to be forced to go through their endogenous puberty and maybe go through changes that they can never really feel okay with. That's that's also harm. Those are also children. Like, I want all children to have the best possible outcomes, to be as happy and healthy as they can possibly be. And uh, making laws to attack trans people, to exclude trans people, does not accomplish helping anybody. All it does is helps those hegemonic forces cement their power and to make you think, oh, I should vote for this person because they're actually doing something and protecting those children when they're not protecting those children. There's lots of issues that affect children. Like, holy shit, well, didn't Republicans like repeal like a, a school lunch fucking thing earlier this year or last year? Like, why can't we talk about that? Can we just give kids food, please? That sounds like an important issue. I don't care what gender a kid <laughs> is. Anyway. Yeah. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay. Well, we uh, do have to wrap up, but uh, thank you for the call and thank you for being an honest and good good right. faith interlocutor on the topic. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tyler. Have a good one. Okay. Now that we're done our grandstanding. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, okay. So I already did the lowdown of the shows for the next week, so I'm not going to do it again because I'm too fucking lazy. But we're moving on to the super chat portion of the show, which is where if you would like to have your message read and you don't want to call in, if you send a super chat of five dollars or more, we will read it out live right here on the air. So uh, we're going to get into that. Let's pull that up. Do you want to go first? All right. 120 check sex from Pedro Glosser, or Glosser. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Sharing your guys' mood from the start of the show. Glad I at least managed to send this before falling asleep. I'll catch the rest of the show tomorrow. Awesome. You'll be here to listen to me mispronounce your name. Uh, but I hope you have a good <laughs> sleep. <laughs> Thanks, Pedro. All right, we've got five pounds from Grimbeard from the UK. The Tory party are immensely unpopular. They're hoping that an anti-trans, anti-woke culture war will save them. And it won't. Hashtag Team Dr. Ben. Yeah, that's a great tie-in to that last call. It is a... It, it's weird because it has historically and even present seems to be to some degree politically effective. Uh, but when you poll, people don't seem to think that trans issues should be something we focus on. I think most people care about like healthcare and <laughs> like, you know, uh, uh, global relations with other countries and trade and those things that actually affect people. But yeah, it is uh, frustrating the way that it can still be such a powerful wedge despite being not popular in with regard to polling. Uh, <laughs> $5 from Julian Hanau. Uh, Bumblebee smiley face. Uh, or is it be happy? Face. I think it's saying be happy. Be happy. That is good. That's clever. That. We're both very tired and it took a second. <laughs> it took yeah. way longer than it should have. To, <laughs> to be honest, that. I'm surprised we had any productive calls today because we were both not really <laughs> having it. And we had a couple, so... Good on you guys. Thanks for being good callers. Yeah. Like, I've said so many times... That last caller, I want callers like that. People who, mm -hmm. even though we're reiterating those points a lot and it gets a little frustrating sometimes to have to like go through uh, the reality of trans healthcare for kids again. But this, like he pointed out, the media is so, doing such a powerful anti-trans campaign and it really is like where our efforts are needed, I think, is in areas like that. So as frustrating as it is, it's nice to... uh have that anyway sorry 499 from amethyst mcleish uh hashtag team art and ben got it last week you need to create balance tories can go fuck themselves trans rights or human rights thank you amethyst i still haven't set up my my scoreboard button because i i didn't get ready for the show until it was like last minute so i'm sorry it's fine we're probably not keeping super well tracked but i agree with yeah. all that except for the hashtag team art and that part can just not be there no okay um <laughs> For 2069, check sex from Naresh. I love this is a trip. Uh, I'm doing great. Cats are doing great. Today is a great day. So have some monies. Hashtag team Venus. So go listen to a 10-hour compilation of Ben Shapiro being an idiot 
at 1.5 times speed, Jimmy. If Jimmy's not here, good job, Arden. Jimmy's um, not I here. I think Jimmy, yeah, I think Jimmy just like didn't want to read this trip of a comment. So that's why Jimmy is not here today. So I'm guessing go listen to a 10-hour compilation of Ben Shapiro being an idiot at 1.5 speed is a replacement for go fuck yourself. Because yeah, I mean, I guess right. that, that sounds like the equivalent. Uh, $4.99 from Haley Fife. I was transphobic to a good friend in high school. Is it appropriate to reach out and apologize? I was in an indoctrinated mindset. No excuse. Hashtag team Arden. Interesting. Mm. I got so much transphobia and I have had a couple people reach out and be like, hey, I, I'm sorry I was shitty to you or whatever, but I'm not going to lie to me. It just kind of rang hollow, like too little too late. I'm already damaged from what you okay. did to me. And like, I, I'm glad you're not a shitty person anymore, but I don't really care. <laughs> uh, I don't know. How do you feel, Ben? Um, I mean... Depending on how well you kind of know the person. I mean, it might be a nice gesture, but also kind of what Arden said. It, it can be a hit or a miss depending on the person and how you think they might respond. And also kind of dependent on what you did to them. Yeah. Um, because if it was something like small, like where there wasn't a whole lot of specific conflict over it. Um, like it might be more well received, but if it was something like really bad, then maybe just don't. Yeah. Like I think there's a better way to do this, which is to go out advocating for trans people and to like hope that they see it. I think that mm -hmm. would be so much more impactful to me. Like, you, uh, talk is cheap like you can say you're sorry but like are you still voting for trump probably then i don't give a fuck like, your, your your apology is absolutely useless to me but if i see you're like advocating for like good political figures and like maybe doing something like speaking at the school board uh to advocate for trans kids in your area then i'd be like oh shit this person actually like really did realize the harm that they cause and is like actually seeking to counter it now you know what i mean that would be really meaningful um but yeah i ew, i i would wage caution on that but they might find it really touching i don't know uh for 99 from sarah wilson seeing sophie being herself was incredible this is this shows why communities like this are so important but also dr ben is so cute in his hoodie i did see sarah commenting <laughs> a couple times about this this is a new hoodie um it's a nice i like it it's good nice, so nice i bought hoodie. it yeah yeah no it's very comfy um but thank you thank you sarah <laughs> <laughs> yeah also it is super cool that sophie showed up today asked mm. i love that for her um uh, 169.69 check sex from Naresh. Uh, ben handled Jay expertly. Hope Jay changes his way of seeing trans people. For me, completely accepting people's genders has helped my feelings for them feel more genuine. Hashtag one more team based Dr. Venus. <laughs> that was a lot in that hashtag. Uh, but yeah, we had some. I was very blunt today. I hope um, people didn't take too much offense, but. You know, it happened. I, what got <laughs> me was that Jay was dead silent after you dropped that on him. And it, it was yep. totally justified. <laughs> he needed to hear that. But, oh my God, he had nothing to say after. And I'm like, look, man. Look, he stepped in yeah. it. I don't know what to tell Sometimes you. Sometimes people need to know that the world isn't about them. And this is one of those times where a caller needed to learn that the world isn't about him. It did feel like, how am I supposed to deal with having an unresolved crush? What if my dick doesn't get wet? What am I supposed to do then, Dr. Ben? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird time. Five pounds uh, from Freakish Uproar. Uh, oh, no, no, I read Narash. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. this one's for me. Five pounds from Freakish Uproar. Sorry I'm late. I hope the stream has been relatively sane up until now. It was, a th I mean, go back, go back and watch the rest of this because uh, Arden and I were both not taking shit today. Um, <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it. 
I don't know how sane it was. I, I honestly expected <laughs> to get flamed more on the neo pronoun conversation, but I think I, I couched my feelings very carefully with enough nuance that people understood where I was coming from. So, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to make sure I was like, you know, do it as carefully as possible. Four ninety nine from Lucky Dog. Love the show. You both are awesome. Thank you, Lucky Dog. You're Thank awesome. you, Lucky Dog. You need a picture of a dog as your uh, a picture. True. Five dollars from Firebird XX. My second cousin came out as trans, and I told her about the show. So don't be surprised if you hear from her or her mom in the coming weeks. Well, we oh. would love to hear from your cousin and or her mom. Uh, it would be a great conversation. Uh, thanks for sending more people our way. Yeah, absolutely. Send this like clip to them, and yeah, we I absolutely invite that call. Uh, Okay, we've got five pounds from Samantha Patrick. Hashtag Team Arden. Yeah, uh, okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> uh, five pounds from Samantha Patrick. Hashtag Team Dr. Ben. And again, Samantha, we, I don't, I don't know if you like showing up here for us to call you a fence sitter every single week. <laughs> um, maybe you just enjoy that. But um, once again, you're, you're not really on anybody's side if you vote for both of us. Yeah, I <laughs> I love how Samantha has found a way around when we're like when they said two and one, we're always like, that doesn't count. We're not gonna count that at all. You're <laughs> yeah. a fence sitter, no 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 no. And then Samantha's like, okay, what if I just send two different ones, one right after the other? And it's like, you know what? Fuck you, Samantha. <laughs> Fuck you. And you're, you're fucking You're still a fence sitter. You're still a fence sitter. <laughs> We're going to uh, allow it. We appreciate it, but you're still a fence sitter. <laughs> 9.99 from Dej the second. Uh, hopefully I say that right. I think I heard someone else say DJ. I don't know if it's DJ or Dej. Like how they say DJ's name. It looks like Dej. <laughs> it looks yeah. like Dej to me. Related to the first caller, as a trans kinkster, as I have met multiple trans men at, that have detrans misgendering kink, as someone generally attracted to women, it feels icky and confusing thoughts i mean if somebody like i i see i i personally do not compute it does not compute with my brain how somebody would have this but if if this is something that like they express to you like hey this is something that i like especially as a kink then um and if you're okay going along with that then like i mean i don't see a problem like, as long as they specify, like, this is my personal preference. Yeah, I... It's just it's odd. I heard of people <laughs> liking slurs and stuff like that, and I think there's a, a way to do that gracefully, perhaps. But I've never heard of a detrans misgendering kink, and I would want to push someone into a pit of hungry sharks if they did that to me. Um... <laughs> I like mm, I, at the same time. So as as a uh, uh, a corn star corn worker, uh, uh, <laughs> you guys get what I'm trying to drop here. Um, I've had some customers who were interested in things that bordered on not this line specifically, but other moral lines that made me very uncomfortable. And I always kind of feel like, like Ben said, if you're comfortable engaging with that, and they say. I'm into that, then it's fine. Everyone's consenting. But I also think, you know, don't feel bad about saying, I'm sorry, but that makes me uncomfortable. I, it feels wrong to me. And so I'm not comfortable doing it because that's also totally valid. Um, just because they're consenting to it doesn't mean it makes you comfortable. Uh, yeah. Is this me? Uh, $10 from Mo Scoville. Glad I was able to catch some of the show today. Looks spicy. I like spicy. Hashtag Team Arden. I know Mo likes it's spicy. Just, <laughs> I just, it almost seems like an ad for your uh, your your corn content a as well. Looks spicy. Yeah. I like spicy. Hashtag Team Arden. That should just be your your new slogan for your. Uh, for your corn stuff. I saw some, some bigot in the chat say you'll <laughs> never be a woman. And it's so right. Ben will never be a woman because Ben is a man. Yeah. We love to see the stark allyship in chat. It's beautiful. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, all right. Well, that was the last super chat for now. So I'm going to do a 
quick wrap up. Thank you to Jess for call screening. Uh, great calls today. I, we got so many good ones at the end that we couldn't get to them because people consistently call in like the best calls and the highest frequency when we're at like the last half hour of the caller portion. And I'm like, how many times? How many right. times do we have to say it? Call in early if you want to get taken. Um, also, uh, I see the mods are having to do work because these dumb bigots are trying to be stupid and bigoted. So we're going to wrap up the show. Uh, thank you guys so much to Dylan and Cookies and whoever else is modding in chat right now. Let's uh, make sure we can end I think we job. just got another super chat. We did. Quick. Yeah. $5 from John S. said, I can't choose. I think you're both wonderful. I think you're wonderful, John S. Uh, you're wonderful, John. But let's wrap this up so our mods can be done. Thank you guys so much. Uh, be back here next week to watch the show with myself and Katie. See you later. Bye. Bye.